Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again for our seminar series. Um, this week, our speaker is going to be Thomas Day from the Yunker Lab, and he is going to be talking about his work um, on scaffolding heritable multicellular traits through physically emergent Darwinian materials. Sounds very cool, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, as always, we'll hold questions till the end where you can just unmute and go ahead and ask your question, um, or you can type it in the chat and I will go ahead and read it out for you. So without further delay, I throw it to you, Thomas. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, let me pull up my slides. All right, so you all can see the presenter view, yes? Um, Looks good. Well, yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Um, yeah, please, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing the kinds of questions and comments that uh, this crowd has for this project because I've been hearing a lot from, I guess, the sort of echo chamber of my own lab and uh, as such, but especially since I'm in the physics department, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from some uh, biologists in particular about what this project is and uh, how believable you guys find it. Um, anyway, so my project that I'm hoping to share with you all today is about how uh, the very first steps in the evolution of, of multicellularity occur. And um, to start off, I'd like to you know, make the observation that simple, undifferentiated groups are likely the first step in the transition to multicellularity. And these types of groups form readily in both laboratory, uh, laboratory experiments, um, naturally in fossils, there are extant organisms like the coenoflagellates uh, that are around today that are these sort of simple amorphous disordered groups. Um, but uh, groups can't be considered a multicellular individual until they pass the checklist of Darwinian individual traits. For instance, they have to be able to reproduce, there has to be some heritable variation that they can pass to the offspring, etc. So what I'm interested in in this project is how do these organisms acquire this checklist? Um, in modern multicellular organisms, uh, heritability is genetically regulated, right? Here I have a, a picture of a fruit fly embryo where a variety of different cells have been painted corresponding to which group developmental genes um, control the cell growth and positioning and this type of stuff is highly choreographed, right? And what this means is that the fruit fly can produce a bunch of complicated tissues with complicated functions um, and uh, can pass on these complicated tissues and functions to their offspring with simple modification, modifications to these group genes. Right? Um, but multicellular genes are a multicellular adaptation in themselves, and it seems like it would take a while for them to evolve. Nonetheless, despite the fact that this seems like a pretty challenging process, um, we find in the fossil record that this happened a bunch of different times um, in all of the domains of life, eukaryotes, bacteria, archaea, and uh, a bunch of different times separately and independently back and forth sometimes. Um, and so this leads us to believe that maybe there's actually a common process that um, scaffolds these heritable regulated traits before genetic regulation evolves. And this allows groups to participate in the Darwinian algorithm. But the chief problem for these early disordered groups is that cell division is random. Um, randomness seems to pose a, a big obstacle. Um, and the reason is that you know, we tend to think of like a randomly folded piece of paper is not gonna make a good paper airplane, right? Um, these things are seen by us intuitively to be non-functional and then also not very consistent. Um, if you just randomly fold a piece of paper, it seems like you're never gonna get the paper to look exactly the same twice. Um, and uh, this is actually though, uh, kind of really bad intuition on our parts. And uh, that's one of the things that I hope to start off by convincing you in this talk that random processes can actually uh, uh, 
can actually, or sorry, consistent processes can actually emerge from highly random processes and they can be highly consistent. And so that's gonna be kind of the first part of my talk here. Um, in the second part of my talk, I'm gonna say, well, what kinds of consistent structural traits um, lead to heritable multicellular traits and what does this mean for actual multicellular organisms? Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna start to uh, explore how prevalent is this process among different kinds of you know, possible multicellular, early multicellular organisms. Right? Um, so to start, let's walk through a thought experiment that will highlight just how consistent distributions can arise from random processes. Which is the first thing here. Um, and to do this, I'm going to talk about what's called the maximum entropy principle. And this sounds very intimidating. Um, and actually there's a, uh, I think, a famous quote from somebody, um, you know, the, there was a, a famous physicist and mathematician, Claude Shannon, who uh, was trying to name this entropic uh, uh, principle that he was coming up with in the 1940s, I believe, um, or, or maybe even more recently. But somebody joked to him that he should name it entropy because nobody really understands what entropy is. Um, and I find that to be pretty sad. Uh, I think the maximum entropy principle here, it sounds very intimidating, but it's actually a pretty straightforward process. So I'd like to walk you through an example to help illustrate exactly what this principle means. So if you bear with me, we'll see how this is relevant in just a minute. But the thought experiment I want to, I want to consider is that I have some amount of money and I'm handing it out to 10 different people in the crowd. Um, so we've got $100 and we've got 10 people. Well, immediately what we can say about this um, is uh, if I have to hand out all $100, that everybody has to get $10, right? That's the mean amount of money that everybody gets. Um, but what we want to know is what is the most likely way that I hand out this money? What is the most likely distribution? And, uh, you know, so let's think about some ways that I might do this. One way is that I could hand out $10 to literally every person, right? Um, and there's only one way to do this. Uh, I, I label, I, I'm going to enumerate the number of ways there's to do something by this omega, um, but there's only one way that everybody gets exactly $10. And so then if we were to plot a distribution of, okay, how likely is it that you receive anywhere from $0 to $100, uh, and if I was restricted to only handing out money in this way, then everybody who was part of these 10 people would expect to get exactly $10 and no other amount of money. But this isn't the only way that I can hand out the money. I could also hand it out, uh, giving $9 to one person, $11 to one person, and then $10 to the other eight people. Right? And if we enumerate how many ways there is to do this, there's actually 90 ways to do this. Um, and you know, if I was restricted to only this blue class then, and we plotted the probability distribution, what we would find is you have an 80% chance of getting uh, $10, a 10% chance of getting nine, and a 10% chance of getting 11. If I was just handing out uh, if all of these subcases were equally likely. But now I ask you, uh, if I'm restricted now to these two classes, the blue and the green classes, um, and all of these cases within these classes are equally likely, what's the most likely distribution that we observe? Well, even though we're, there's only 10 people in my uh, thought experiment here, it's way more likely, you know, 90 out of 91 chances that we're going to observe this blue distribution. Right? Um, and so what we can ask is, well, what's the distribution that maximizes this number of ways? Uh, and that's the distribution that we're more likely to observe. And it's actually gonna be way more likely than any of these other ways of handing out money. Um, and there's some pretty uh, intense mathematical tools that actually help us with this problem. Um, so I'm gonna write down the entropy now. That's, that's this capital H. And as it turns out, it's just, uh, intimately related to this number of ways, this omega. You take the logarithm of the number of ways. Um, in classical physics, we have a uh, like a, a constant that multiplies this out front that just gives it the right units, but that's not important for what we're considering now. Um, and so, if we're maximizing the number of ways, you know, the logarithm is just a monotonically increasing function, so we're also maximizing this entropy. Uh, and uh, an equivalent way of writing this that Shannon uh, derived was to write it out like this in terms of this probability distribution, right? Where we, this is the probability that someone receives V dollars. P of V, log P of V, you just integrate it, 
and this gives you the entropy. So we want to maximize, we want to find the function, right, the P of V that maximizes this value, but we have a constraint. And the constraint is that I have this much money to hand out, right? So uh, the way that you can do this is through what's called the calculus of variations and a method of Lagrange multipliers, but that's kind of in the weeds. What I think is important is that you can turn the crank on this and you can figure out what this distribution is. And the prediction is that the distribution is an exponential distribution of how I hand out money. Um, and now if, if we were in person, maybe I could run this experiment actually by handing out like monopoly dollars or something, but uh, we're not in person. And besides there's only, you know, it would only take, it would take time for me to actually do that. So uh, what I did is I went ahead and took the liberty of simulating this uh, where I simulated handing out $100 to 10 people. And I did it, I think a thousand times. And we see this black line here is the predicted distribution of how much money people get. And these gray bars is actually what happened in the simulations. And we see we get a really good agreement for the maximum entropy distribution. So we can actually say a lot about what this distribution is solely by knowing what the constraint is, really. Um, and that's pretty powerful. Um, OK, so this is an example, you know, pretty an example now that I've picked, right, with this $100 handing out across 10 people, um, what kind of constraints must a multicellular organism experience? Um, well, it's a little tautological, perhaps, but multicellular organisms take up space. Um, if we imagine, you know, a, a particular cell within an organism takes up some physical area or physical volume, right? Uh, literally both the volume inside the uh, cell's membrane or its cell wall or something, but also a portion of the empty space around it because there are gaps between cells in multicellular organisms, um, just generally speaking. And, uh, you know, so we have a constraint then that there is some total volume, right? All of these little individual volumes associated with each cell have to add up together to equal this total clump. That's what I'm trying to show here. You know, that each individual cells together, they add up this total capital V, I call it. Right. Um, and then another constraint for cells is that, you know, they have to occupy at least some space. Unlike in the previous example where I could have handed out zero dollars to somebody, uh, I can't hand out zero space to a particular cell because they're incompressible, you know, beyond some threshold. Um, and so we can write down the entropy and we can say which distribution is are we most likely to observe of these volumes uh, within this uh, organism, for instance. And so long as these are the only rules that, uh, you know, correspond to how these groups grow, then uh, Asti et al. back in 2008 proved that this is the distribution that you should observe. This is the maximum entropy distribution. Um, and so we have a prediction now for what the volumes within a multicellular organism should be solely based on this constraint. So let's go test this prediction with some simple multicellular groups. The one that I'm going to pick uh, to start off is snowflake yeast group, and this is uh, partially because of its proximity to uh, Georgia Tech here, since Will Ratcliffe has uh, been faculty here for a number of years now. But the basic, if you haven't, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the snowflake yeast experimental system. Just in case you haven't, uh, basically there's previously unicellular yeast that evolved to form these multicellular groups through incomplete cytokinesis um, and what we follow or what we find in these groups right is that cells occupy some space okay so there's one of our constraints these groups fill a volume right um, and they form these branch tree like structures in this volume and then the last constraint is that cells have to be uh, you know there's, there's no other rules to how these groups are assembled and in within these groups the cells divide randomly uh, if I'm tracking, you know, this azimuthal angle here, uh, where bud scars are appearing on new cells, uh, I find that it's pretty uniformly distributed across the surface. Um, cells can basically appear anywhere in the bulk. And so we have a pretty good reason to believe that this type of multicellular organism may follow our prediction uh, for cellular volume distribution kind of thing. So uh, what we did to test this then is uh, one of my lab mates went to the University of Illinois where they have a scanning electron microscope equipped with a microtome. And uh, because of 
uh, that pretty amazing piece of equipment, we were able to locate the cell centers to with nanometer precision, right? And so uh, I find the cell centers. Um, I can find the total volume of the group uh, via uh, what's called the convex hull. Um, now it's just a method that we choose to find a total volume of the group. Other um, methods could work similarly well. Uh, if you imagine like a sphere, you know, the smallest sphere then closes the group or something like that. Um, but this is just the one that we picked. And then within this convex hull, you run what's called a Voronoi tessellation, where you correspond the space that's closest to one particular cell and no other. And then I map out, well, what's the distribution of space that we observe? And when I do that, I find pretty remarkable agreement with the maximum entropy prediction, uh, which is uh, very exciting for us. Right? And um, uh, what we decided to do next, just to um, get a little bit more data involved, is uh, I developed some simulations of these types of groups where cells butt off of mother cells with you know, uh, angles defined from experimentally measured values, and they're attached via these rigid chitinous bonds. Um, and I can run now 10,000 of these simulations and see uh, how well does that match up with the maximum entropy distribution, and it's spot on. Um, and so what this allows us to do now, if I, you know, if I, if we take a look at this larger plot and I plot, okay, what's our predicted value for a, partic for a particular bin and what is the uh, actual observed value that we measure, um, you know, we extend across four orders of magnitude. These white dots are the experimental data and the gray triangles are the uh, simulation data that uh, I've run through here. And so this is pretty exciting to us, right? How do consistent structural traits emerge from random processes? Well, the maximum entropy principle guides the emergence of these consistent cell packing distributions without any other rules, right? And they're highly consistent. They're gonna follow this, uh, uh, you know, way more times than they don't. So now we can move on to the second part of the talk. Well, what does this mean for a multicellular organism to have this consistent packing distribution? And uh, what we'll what I'm going to uh, argue is that basically any multicellular trait that relies on cell packing is going to be affected by this consistent cell packing distribution. Right? For snowflake yeast, it happens to be that a very important group trait, group size, is affected by this cell packing distribution. And the reason for this is that uh, snowflake yeast are attached, you know, daughter cells are attached to their mother cells via these rigid, fixed, chitinous bonds. And uh, uh, I just would like to point out at this point that, you know, these kind of fixed bonds between cells is not uh, something that is unique to snowflake yeast. It's uh, seen across plants, um, different fungi, red algaes. They have these types of fixed bonds between their cells. Um, but what this means for snowflake yeast is that if you, since they grow in this kind of tree-like pattern, if you break any one of these bonds, you fracture the group into two separately viable pieces. And uh, how do these bonds break? Well, cell crowding actually leads to mechanical fracture of these bonds. So what you're seeing on the right here is this um, time-lapse where groups grow and cells continue to bud within the group uh, but they push on one another over time, and this internal stress builds up until eventually one of these bonds fractures, and uh, then two separately viable pieces uh, emerge, and these are, you know, this is a group reproduction process, and uh, this continues and continues and continues uh, repeatedly until, you know, in this time lapse, these clusters fill the screen. And what we notice is that, you know, this is a pretty, at the end here, this is a pretty consistent size distribution of these clusters. Can we predict this size distribution given the fact that we know something about how cells are packed and this cell packing leads to mechanical fracture? Well, the way that we're going to do this is by using what's uh, a weakest link theory type model. And what this means is that, uh, you know, we say Groups fracture when a particular cell within the, side, within the group uh, occupies less than some critical volume that I call V star. Um, 
And if any of the cells occupy a volume less than or equal to V star, then the entire material fails. Um, so the probability that one cell has less than V star volume, well, we know what the distribution is, right? We've got the histogram and here's the, you know, the, the maximum entropy distribution that we predict. So we can integrate from, you know, the smallest possible size to this V star. Um, and we can pull out a number, this probability, P star. Now, the way that I calculate V star is by running some simulations of experimentally distributed cell sizes and cell shapes. Um, I, I basically, I, I have one mother cell and I bought a bunch of daughters off of it and I bought as many as I can. And then I find what is the, uh, you know, the Voronoi volume associated with this complex uh, where, I, where I maximize the number of cells, excuse me, on one mother cell. Um, and that's where this V star comes from. So it's, you know, it's from simulations. Uh, I'm not fitting it or anything. And uh, this is just the, the P star probability. It's just a number that I calculate. And so then from here we say, well, if there are you know, capital N cells in a group, um, the only way that this group exists at size N is if all of the cells have space more than V star. If any of them had less than V star, the group would fracture. And so this uh, now becomes our prediction for how many groups should exist at size n. And when I plot this over top of a measured size distribution, we are spot on. Um, these dashed lines here, or these dotted lines, are, are associated with you know, um, the variance in calculating V star here. Um, and uh, you know, it, this is a 95% confidence interval I show. So we find this to be pretty exciting. Um, what this means is that we can predict, you know, we, so we can predict the fracture size distribution of these snowflake yeast, right? Um, and they have this predictable fracture size. And this is kind of antagonistic to uh, a different way of forming a multicellular yeast group, uh, flocculating yeast. Flocculating yeasts are just sticky aggregates where the cells stick kind of like Velcro to one another. Um, and Unlike in snowflake yeast, where only one bond needs to break for a group to fracture, flocculating yeast would require many bonds to break in order to uh, fracture, to cleave into two pieces, right? And that's a much more rare event. Um, and so we would expect that it, it is not bounded on the upper end the same way that snowflake yeast is. Um, and so we would expect then that snowflake yeast would in general have a more peaked size distribution while flocculating yeast would have a more spread size distribution. And when we measure this, uh, Jennifer Pence measures this in a recent publication in Current Biology, uh, that's exactly what we find, right? Snowflake yeast have uh, this you know, pretty well-defined peak for their size distribution, while flocculating, pe uh, flocculating yeast can exist anywhere from single cells all the way up to these massive aggregates. So we get a consistent group size uh, out that emerges out of the mechanics here. Um, and one, one more point I'd like to make about this is that this group size is actually adaptable from mechanics. Um, in previous work, we found that with continued selection for large size, groups evolve to become larger. Um, and the way that they do this is uh, actually by uh, manipulating cell shape. So uh, if the cells become more elongated over time. And what this means is that there's slightly more room per cell in the group, so you can fit more cells in before that internal stress threshold is reached. So, we have now the first two sections of uh, my talk here. Well, consistent, it's a, there's this two-step process, basically. First, consistent cell packing can emerge just from the straight physics of uh, maximum entropy statistics, and then, um, any traits that rely on cell packing can emerge as uh, predictable and adaptable, and this can happen before the evolution of genomic regulation uh, to these group level traits. So how universal is this process is now the, la the last part of my talk here. Well, there's only two rules, really. Uh, groups have to occupy a total physical space. This could be a 2D space or a 3D space, and uh, every single group Every single multicellular group should follow this first rule. And the second rule is that 
uh, these volumes are, in the, are, are independently allocated in these organisms. And cells are positioned sufficiently randomly for this to happen. Now, not all multicellular groups are going to follow this rule. However, we might expect that the simple, disordered, uh, early stage multicellular groups will. Right? And so in these groups, traits of theirs that rely on cell packing will emerge as predictable and adaptable. Uh, to test this out, I started off by running some simulations of a variety of different growth morphologies. Right, These different kinds of things have different growth morphologies, whether they're sticking together or they are uh, growing within a membrane or something along those lines. So I, I ran a variety of different simulations with these different kinds of organisms in mind. First thing I simulated were these sticky aggregates where spherical cells uh, bud at different, I, I varied the different angles um, and they interact with both you know, steric repulsive interactions and also some attractive interactions to keep them in a group. You know, we have sort of biofilm-y like things in mind with this. Uh, and we find that these groups pack their cells according to the maximum entropy principle. Okay. Um, in tree-like groups, more like snowflake yeast, but also, you know, some pretty, some more rudimentary filamentous fungi and uh, that sort of organism is what we have in mind here. These follow the maximum entropy principle, just like we expected from our snowflake yeast studies. Um, next, I, I switched over to a growth morphology where there's cells growing in some, side, some sort of maternal membrane. Uh, the kinds of groups that I have in mind for this are things like, uh, you know, Matt Heron's recently published work and scientific reports about uh, Clematomonas evolving into groups that form stuff kind of like this. Uh, and then there's some fossils uh, that I found um, that are believed to be, you know, early uh, animal embryo kind of things that uh, have this enclosing membrane. Uh, and there's also uh, some extant multicellular organisms like baocyte production in, I think, Steneria or something like that. Uh, you guys probably know much more about that kind of thing than me. Um, but this is just a pretty common way that uh, groups might form. And we find that within these membranes, you know, the cells are confined by the membrane. They're kind of corralled in. Uh, this, they follow the maximum entropy packing distribution. Um, last, I decided to look at cells on a surface instead of, you know, inside one of these volumes. Um, and the kind of the model system I, I was having in mind for this was the coanoflagellates that, you know, there's a central core of extracellular matrix and cells populate the exterior uh, of it and they bump one another. Um, and so there's, you know, some uh, minimum distance that must separate these cells. And we find that in these types of simulations, they also follow maximum entropy prediction. Um, so many different kinds of groups may be affected by maximum entropy. Um, and now their goal is, uh, our goal is to find another extant organism that does this um, and, you know, or, or to find vestiges of this in an extant organism. Now, the one that we picked for the last part of my talk here is sort of a flagship organism of uh, recently evolved multicellularity, Volvox. Um, and partially why we, why we chose this is because it's known that the Volvox evolved within the last I believe 50 million years or so. And, um, you know, because of that, they have some slight, uh, they have a little bit more complex functions, right? They have some cellular differentiation. There are some somatic cells, these little green dots that are distributed kind of around the surface of this sort of lumpy sphere. Um, and then there are these large reproductive cells. Oops, I didn't mean to click. These large reproductive cells uh, that are kind of embedded in the sphere. Now, what I'm going to be considering is these somatic cells, uh, the non-reproductive ones that are sort of on the outside. And what we can notice about them is that, well, they occupy some space, right? There's a total surface area to this spherish uh, volvox, and each cell occupies some fraction of that space. Um, and furthermore, that they're disordered on there. They're not forming a neat lattice. Um, so, and furthermore, as the volvox you know, continues to grow, these cells start off a little bit closer to one another and uh, there's ECM secreted between them. And so there can be fluctuations in how much ECM is secreted between each of the cells. And so some of the cells may be located a little bit further apart than other ones. Um, and so we expect there to be this sort of disordered uh, cellular structure to the volvox. 
So I went through and ran my Voronoi tessellation on some, on some data uh, that we obtained from the Goldstein lab at the University of Cambridge. And we find that the maximum entropy principle does a pretty good job of predicting the uh, distribution of solid angles subtended by each of the somatic cells. And what this tells us is that extant multicellular groups, even with some simple developmental stages like the Volvox has, may still encounter uh, this maximum entropy principle and may be affected by it. So if you were to take away nothing else from my talk today, uh, I've, I feel like I've said it several times already, but I'll say it one more time. Um, maximum entropy statistics can drive uh, the emergence of these very predictable um, are Darwinian materials that can take part in the Darwinian algorithm prior to having the uh, necessary or the seemingly necessary um, multicellular developmental genes. All right, thank you all very much for listening to my talk. I want to thank uh, these people, in particular Peter and Will, for providing me funding and a lot of uh, advice and support. These are my uh, lab members in the Junker lab. Um, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to do much of this without their uh, continued comments on my, uh, you know, group reports and stuff like that. And then last, I'd like to thank these people for uh, helping me with, with some of the Volvox stuff. Uh, Matt Heron helped me get started by pointing me towards the Goldstein people, and then the Goldstein people were uh, very helpful in sending me some data and uh, things along that line. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for listening. Um, I would be very excited to hear what kinds of questions and comments you folks have for me. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> hey, sorry there. I was having some network issues. Yeah, I'm, I cut out for a minute there. <laughs> but uh, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and just unmute yourself and ask them or uh, write them in the chat and I'll read them out for you. All right, looks like we have a question from Tony in the chat. Uh, Tony says, first of all, nice. Uh, do you have any ideas about if certain geometries allow higher entropy and if that has anything to do with the favorability of evolution? Hmm. In geometries. So I, I suppose, Tony, what you would be meaning is, uh, well, I guess, do you mean t uh, geometry or do you mean like topologies? Like the Snowflake East has the uh, sort of tree-like topology where the cells are connected. Oh. Yeah, I'll just I'll just talk. Yeah, yeah, basically, if you do you have like so different topologies, different ways that the cells can relate to each other, does that allow different sort of total entropies if those are comparable? And does that have anything to do with sort of directions evolution might take? Well, so I would what I would imagine, first of all, is that a tree like topology is actually um, restricting the total amount of possible cell locations as opposed to a, a sort of sticky-like group, right, where the cells can unattach and reattach and unattach and reattach in different places and different locations and move around like that, right? That's going to have more ways of assembling cells, for instance. Um, I think what would be really cool would be to, to uh, and something that I'm definitely interested in, is seeing how these different topologies actually affect uh, the evolutionary process. I know, I know David and, and Pedro and uh, some other people did um, some studies about like differentiation and how that's affected, well, by like the, you know, the different ways that cells might communicate, right? And if cells communicate along these intercellular bonds, then a tree-like topology will be communicating differently than, uh, you know, a sticky topology, which would be more like, you know, every neighbor is interacting with every other neighbor kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I have not thought much about this sort of um, interaction between the cells very much in an entropic sense, if that's what you're asking about. Okay. But, yeah. I, yeah. We should we should talk later at some point. I've got some fun 
ideas going on about changing the geometry of snowflake yeast and how that affects their uh, durability. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Talk to Tony. Hey, Tom. Uh, fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, most of your of the fits that you did of the distribution, I guess the solid land with the histogram, the gray shadows, they fit pretty well in there. They look like astoundingly well um, together. But mm -hmm. in the bulb box case, we see a little bump at the end of the distribution. I yeah, was wondering, yeah, let me, let me swing what back is, to that one. what's the intuition between having a bump, uh, whether above or below the expected distribution biologically? How, what's the intuition behind that? So, actually, maybe, maybe I can answer your question a little bit more um, by talking about how organisms might break maximum entropy, right? So I've, I, I didn't show that here because I, I didn't think I was going to have enough time to get through it. <laughs> um, but I've been recently doing some experiments where, well, some simulational experiments where I try to break the maximum entropy distribution, right? Um, so here is one example. Um, and basically the way that organisms might break maximum entropy, well, I mean, there's, there's a couple different ways that they might do it. Um, but one of the ways that you might imagine is that they have a, some sort of growth plan. Uh, if you're planning exactly where each of the cells is going to go, and you know, like on the left-hand side, you are exactly right every time placing a cell in the exact correct position, um, then you're not going to have this maximum entropy distribution because it relies on randomness. And so, you know, if I, you know, this DT is supposed to measure like the noise strength, right? Uh, so if there's zero noise you know, we're not filling in this whole curve, right? Only some of the values for the volume are seen, for instance, right? And then what I do for this is then I say, well, let me allow these cells to place new cells with a little, you know, at their exact position, plus or minus a little bit of noise, plus or minus one degree, five degrees, 10 degrees, and so on, right? And slowly we recover more and more of the maximum entropy distribution uh, as that happens, right? Um, and uh, you know, this isn't the only way that I've tried. I also tried, um, you know, I, if I flip slides here, I tried a, a couple other ways that groups might break maximum entropy, which we don't have to go into super detail about uh, right now. Um, but I've tried things like, for instance, having two different cell sizes um, and changing how likely is it that a cell reproduces into a cell of the exact same size of itself, or maybe it produces a big cell, uh, you know, 10% of the time kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing I've tried is this sort of uh, like planned apoptosis events. So if a, a group sends out a chemical signal to some of its cells saying, you die now, um, you know, if this is a random, if cells are dying randomly, then we should still expect the maximum entropy distribution to hold. But uh, if there's some correlated death where, you know, cells on this side of the body are dying, then we should expect that we're, we're going to lose, you know, we're going to break maximum entropy predictions that way. Um, so uh, in general, you know, not following maximum entropy means that something along these lines is happening, right? You're somehow reducing the amount of randomness involved in the cell location or something along those lines, right? Um, so for the Volvox, uh, it's a little, I've, I've been wondering about that myself. The, the fit's not as good as the snowflake yeast, right? And I'm not totally sure exactly what the uh, source of that is. I know that Volvox does have some, you know, pretty basic developmental processes, like they've got the inversion process, right? Maybe some of the real Volvox people can uh, pipe in and tell me more about that, actually. Um, but I know that it has this inversion process. Um, I'm also thinking about like correlations of this extracellular matrix secretion between the cells, because if groups of, of cells in one region of the body secrete more extracellular matrix there, then the cells will be located further apart systematically in that part of the Volvox. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, Pedro, but did I, did no, I, I answer your question a lot? Okay. You answered uh, many follow-up questions I could have had. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Yeah.
I had a question from uh, Mengxi in the chat. She says, I wonder if certain fitness advantages are associated with the best cell packing strategy, such as better utilization of nutrients or higher growth rates. Oh. Um, right, so you're commenting about like, if cells, for instance, in the interior of one of these snowflake yeast or something, say it's too crowded in here, we can't get enough food if we keep dividing in the interior, and so they stop, and then cells on the outside continue dividing because they can access the nutrients or something like that. Is that kind of what you're commenting about? Yep. Uh... I think uh, if they're like, uh, do, do like the, there's uh, the theory will like guide some experiments in the future. Like, can we like uh, make some like measure the growth rates inside their inner inner cells and outer cells? I don't know. Yeah, I'm like experimental biologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think what this relates to is like which other group level traits are affected by the cell packing distribution. And I am not totally sure, right? Um, what, I, what I can say is if a, if a multicellular trait is affected by cell packing, then it should be affected by this consistent cell packing distribution that we observe. Um, but yeah, exactly what that, you know, that trait is, whether that's you know, some sort of nutrient availability, um, I'm all ears if you have some uh, things that you think would be good items to test, uh, some good experiments to run. I think it would be very interesting. Um, un unfortunately, I, you know, I, I'm a little bit locked in the physics world sometimes, so I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about uh, fitness, for instance, of uh, different locations of cells in the organism and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to provide me some guidance on that, I would, <laughs> I would I would love to hear it. All right, another question in the chat, and apologies to anybody if I mispronounce your name, um, but a question from Hema, um, who asks, "Have you tried optimizing for other thermodynamic quantities, for example, free energy?" So. Um. It's a really good question, Hema. Um, so the, the, the free energy, I, th I think what you're getting at, right, is that um, let's say cells have some sort of interaction potential between them. Then um, not every single configuration is accessible right? because uh, cells are you know, say it's an attractive interaction, cells are more likely to be located a certain distance from one another. Um, and so then the free energy of this particular configuration would, uh, you know, a, a minimal free energy would be more favorable than one that is not minimal, I guess. And I would say, yes, that is, that is absolutely true. But, um, there, so where this entropy maximization comes from is uh, actually, so the, the ASTI paper that I linked where they derived the maximum entropy distribution, they did that for a granular system. Um, and, you know, granular systems have particular topological constraints, right? Like the cells, or the, uh, not cells, <laughs> the grains have to be in force and torque balance with one another, right? Like they have to be in mechanical equilibrium in order to be sitting there. Um, and there's actually, so there's actually a lot of constraints involved with those uh, force balance equations, basically. And despite that, we still observe the maximum entropy distribution because the volumes are still allocated sufficiently randomly. Um, and that condition, the sufficiently random condition is something that's still puzzling Peter and I, um, because I think we're going to need a, a real theoretical uh, physicist or, or mathematical physicist to help us figure out what does it mean to be sufficiently random. Um, but I like this idea of the like a different thermodynamic quantity 
Um, I don't know. I'd like to hear you elaborate more on that uh, whenever you get the chance there, Hema. I'd, I'd like to hear what this, what yeah, this sort of um, idea is. Okay. Yeah, like what you said, it, it is very interesting that, um, yeah, there is this sufficiently random condition that seems to be important in favoring entropy maximization. Like one of the things that's surprising about biology is, uh, yeah, you have so many constraints that uh, the same principles manifest in different ways leads to different outcomes based on all of these additional constraints. So, yeah. Um, and I was just, uh, it was just, I was just curious to see if you have maximized or minimized for, uh, yeah, like other quantities because entropy maximization is something, uh, yeah, we all uh, know from, yeah, second law of thermodynamics that it gets maximized, but uh, yeah. I was just wondering if you played around with others. Yeah, I see. So yeah, so I, ha so I haven't played around with others yet. I think it's a really good idea though. I don't know exactly how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we could chat more well, about it later, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good idea. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Here we go. We got a question from Jeremy in the chat. Um, he asks, I'm wondering if temperature breaks the max entropy model or does it just kind of shift the distribution? For sure. Um, so I guess you mean like um because these granular materials are athermal right so actually i would so this is actually a really good question and I, I i think i have a good answer the um so this maximum entropy distribution should still hold for something like an ideal gas if you have basically just a room full of particles and you were to just say i'm just randomly throwing them someplace in this volume what is the distribution of volumes that's going to be associated with each of these particles um, you're going to get this maximum entropy distribution of course your your minimum volume is going to be tiny if we're thinking about a gas because the gas particles like you know however large across that's tiny and compared with the room perhaps um, but uh, yeah no this should totally still work for thermal systems um, at least like instantaneously, right? Like if you were to take a snapshot of that system. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question though. I like that. Any other questions? Hey, if that's all the questions we have, it's just to me to thank our speaker again. Thanks very much. Very cool talk. Thank you. And I will see everybody next week. Yeah, thanks for all your comments and questions, everybody. Appreciate it.